Our sit-downs with the godfathers of Wall Street continue with a man who spent 30 years purchasing and selling distressed companies. Soon after, Asher Edelman chronicled his strategy by teaching a course at Columbia entitled Corporate Rating, The Art of War. Then after leaving Wall Street, he made his mark on high-end investing and established Edelman Arts in New York City. He joins us here at the NASDAQ. Asher, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. You say that we are currently in a recession. Every Fed official who speaks to us tells us we are not in a recession. What are they missing? I think it's pretty straightforward. The average American has not had an increase in pay in 15 years, but things have cost, cost more in the marketplaces. He has been in a recession for 15 years. Nothing's changed for him. Uh, up at the top, we're not in a recession. But 80% of the Americans have been in a recession for at least 15 years. So how does that uh, translate into investing, into the stock market? Is it that it's a recession that nobody seems like nobody realizes we are in one, and certainly nobody realizes we've been in one for 15 years? Who is your nobody? I think the broader investing public. If you uphold anybody on the street or anybody on this desk well, right it here. Like, it sounds like you're talking more about financial oppression than you are an economic decline. I mean, I, I get the fact that a lot of people aren't doing as well because s structurally society isn't rewarding them maybe the way they should. I don't, I'm not going to get into that. That's a social the, issue. I'm talking about money and economics. People can buy less for what they have now than they could 15 years ago. In their lives, that's a recession. Okay. So it, how about the, the broader economy, though? How about the labor market that continues to tighten in the United States and in Japan and in Europe? And, and I, you know, I was going to tell me that's a backward leading indicator. But right now, I see a job market that tells me that the service sector is more than making up for manufacturing and commodity. And you are, of course, aware that we have fewer people as a percentage of the population employed today than we did in 2007. Yes. Okay. Well, what, what's that the labor, about wait, a but job is the labor market? market worse? Uh, yes, it is. So and then if you take into account the people who are working in McDonald's who used to run a computer for somebody else, it's Correct. even worse yeah. than that. Let's move on to the presidential elections. I'm, I'm curious. We're asking everybody, essentially, who you think the best candidate for the economy would be. Bernie Sanders. Without a doubt. Why is that? What No what question. Policies? Well, I think it's quite simple again. If you look at something called velocity of money, you guys know what that is, I presume. Mm -hmm. That means how much gets spent and turns around. When you have the top 1% getting money, they spend 5%, 10% of what they earn. When you have the lower end of the economy getting money, they spend 100 or 110 percent of what they earn. As you've had a transfer of wealth to the top and a transfer of income to the top, you have a shrinking uh, a consumer base, basically, and you have a shrinking velocity of money. Mm -hmm. Bernie is the only person out there who I think is talking at all about both fiscal stimulation and banking rules that will get the banks to begin to generate lending again as opposed to speculation. Okay. So from an economic point of view, it's straight. The velocity of money measures the rate at which money goes from one transaction to another in an economy. In simple terms, it's how often and how quickly a dollar changes hands. Usually, if money circulates through an economy at faster speeds, the economy is seeing more transactions and is probably healthier than an economy with a slower velocity of money. A faster velocity also means businesses are further along in the business cycle, which leads to price increases and a higher rate of inflation. To understand the concept, consider a very small and simple economy that includes only three entities, a grocer, a rancher, and a farmer. They have $50 between them, which the grocer just happens to own. The grocer pays the rancher $50 for meat she wants to sell at her store. The rancher pays the farmer $50 for some grain to feed his livestock. The farmer then pays the grocer $50 for groceries she needs to feed her family. The original $50 bought $150 worth of goods by changing hands three times. The velocity of money in this economy is three. The figure can be viewed as the money supply's rate of turnover. Velocity of money is usually measured as a ratio of GNP to a country's total supply of money. Investors can use it to gauge how robust an economy is. And it's about the velocity of money because despite the central bank's best efforts, the velocity of money is at a record low. This comes to us from Strategus Research Partners and what it shows is how many times each dollar in the U.S. money supply is being used. Right now, it's about 1.54 times. That's compared with 
2.1 times back in 2001. So all that cash that central banks are pumping into the financial system is just sitting in bank accounts. It's and the multiplier breath. effect on the economy is pretty minimal. So the onus is on the banks to start taking more risks to achieve higher returns. Uh, they argue that we should not have pay equity for women workers. They argue that we should, in fact, you know what they argue? It's not only we should not raise the minimum wage, many Republicans will come here and tell you we should abolish the concept of the minimum wage. And if you can find that a high unemployment area workers prepared to work for three or four bucks an hour, for many Republicans, that's a good idea. But to answer your question, look, $7.25 is now the federal minimum wage. It's a starvation wage. You do the arithmetic, people can't live on it. We have got to raise the minimum wage over a period of years to a living wage, in my view. Maybe it's a radical view. I don't think so. If somebody works 40 hours a week in the United States of America, that person should not be living in poverty. That's what a $15 minimum wage over a period of years would do. Now, you ask me the question, well, how do you negotiate with Republicans? And I'll tell you how. You rally the American people who overwhelmingly believe, by the way, that the minimum wage should be raised depending on the polls, maybe to 15 bucks an hour. The Republicans get away with murder. They get away with trying to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, not raise the minimum wage, because people are not organized in opposition to them. When we rally the American people, I think the Republicans will see the writing on the wall. They will come along with us. Is that how you avoid class warfare? Because what you've been saying here really promotes class welfare. Class warfare, you mean? Yes. Well, did the, I say welfare? You said class warfare. welfare. Well, you're right. We have been giving welfare to the very wealthiest people in this country for too long. That's not what you meant. But let me talk about so-called class warfare, okay? I've been accused of promoting class warfare, okay? So let me be clear. Class warfare goes on in the United States right now. The rich are getting much richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is disappearing. In the last 30 years, we have seen a shift a redistribution of wealth to the tune of trillions of dollars that have gone out of the hands of the middle class and working families to the top one-tenth of one percent. The Republican budget passed a few months ago gave over $250 billion in tax breaks to the wealthiest two-tenths of one percent, and yet they cut Medicare, they cut Medicaid, they cut health care. That's class warfare. Good morning, Hank. It's Tuesday. So you've started a lot of businesses. Crash Course, SciShow, DFTBA Records, VidCon, the ceaseless juggernaut that is 2D glasses. And Hank, your company's employed dozens of people, none of whom work for the federally mandated minimum wage of $7.25 per hour. But Hank, let's imagine that your next project is a fast food restaurant, corn dogs and sodium. What impact would raising the federal minimum wage have on you and your employees? At first glance, it seems like a no-brainer. Any minimum wage is terrible, both for corn dogs and sodium and for its employees. The Econ one one argument goes like this. The free market is going to set wages where they need to be. Like, if you want to pay $5 an hour for corn dogs and sodium employees, but no one takes the job for $5 an hour, you're going to have to pay more. You'll increase your wages until you can attract the kind of employees that you need to, you know, batter and fry and serve encased cast-off pig meat. And we know that economies tend to grow less when governments set and control prices, so higher minimum wages restrict economic growth. Plus, unemployment will go up, because if the minimum wage is $10 per hour, corn dogs and sodium can only afford to hire one person, but if there was an unrestricted wage market, then they could attract two people who'd be willing to work for $5 an hour each. So in the end, setting a minimum wage is an attempt to alleviate poverty that actually increases it. However, 
However, Hank, surprisingly enough, it turns out that actual labor markets are a lot more complex than the models of labor markets created by college freshmen. This brings us to a famous study by two economists, David Card and Alan Kruger. So in 1992, the state of New Jersey raised its minimum wage 18.8%. Pennsylvania, right next door, did not raise its minimum wage. Card and Kruger had the bright idea to go to the border of New Jersey and Pennsylvania and do employment surveys on either side of it. And what they found is that restaurant employment in New Jersey actually increased when the minimum wage went up. Since then, a bunch of other studies have confirmed Card and Kruger's findings, while some have found that there actually are negative effects to employment when you raise the minimum wage, although it's surprisingly and consistently mild. Why? Well, a bunch of reasons. For one, the minimum wage is probably near where the market would set it. But also, low-wage workers tend to spend most of their pay raises, which leads to increased economic activity, which in turn leads to more jobs. And higher wages also mean less turnover, which leads to lower costs of training and hiring and firing. On the downside, higher wages are also associated with higher prices on goods and services that rely on low-wage labor, which means that your corn dogs, Hank, would probably be a little bit more expensive. But Hank, the larger question is whether raising the minimum wage actually reduces poverty. And on that front, there is growing consensus that, at least in the medium run, it, it does. A number of big recent studies have shown that raising the minimum wage 10% reduces the number of people in poverty by about 2.5%. Even many opponents of the minimum wage acknowledge this, but it's important to note that, like, that won't always work. At some point, raising the minimum wage will lead to inflation and slower job creation. It's just not clear where that point is. But it's just as disingenuous to call the minimum wage a job killer as it is to say that the minimum wage is going to fix economic inequality. In short, Hank, in economics, there's no such thing as a free lunch. But when it comes to reducing poverty without affecting employment, higher minimum wages seem at least to be the cheapest lunch available. But ultimately, Hank, now that I'm, I guess, an employer, I'm more persuaded by the personal argument. We found that paying a living wage, which we would do even if we opened corn dogs and sodium, leads to happier, more productive employees. Now, I know that's hard to quantify, but it's also what's allowed VidCon and DFTBA records to retain employees for years and years and grow sustainably. Now, Hank, obviously I am not an economist, although I did win a bronze medal in economics at the Alabama State Academic Decathlon Tournament in 1993. But our strategy has worked out pretty well for us so far, and it's also working at much larger companies like Costco. Hank, the United States is a rich country, and I think there's a growing body of evidence that the U.S. doesn't benefit from having poor workers. Of course, raising the minimum wage isn't going to fix that problem, but I hope at least we can begin to have a nuanced conversation about the problem. Hank, I'll see you on Friday.